and welcome back to EDH Deck Building. I am your host, Demo, and these are my favorite decks I've made, I, essentially, right? Um, on my channel, the, I'm not talking about any of my personal decks here. So outside of my own personal decks, which are obviously my favorites, outside of that, I have gone through all of the hundreds of decks, um, you know, the deck decks that I do on my channel, and I have picked out the top 10. These are my 10, what I think are the most interesting. Most of them are either a really interesting commander or just a very unique idea I came up with. Essentially, my favorite 10 deck decks I've ever done on my channel. I, some of these are really old. Again, a lot of you have maybe not been with me for as long as my channel has been around. And I'm digging up some old ones here that you guys actually might be interested in. So I'm going to go through them here. And obviously the deck list will be available as well. We're going to start out with my Dragon's Approach deck. I made a Dragon's Approach deck on my channel. It was a blue-red version, which I thought was good for the spell slinging theme. I ended up using Jorian Runediver as the commander just because I thought it was good card advantage. You could swap it out for any blue-red commander that is doing the spell slinger theme. Obviously, there's an absolute ton of those. There was less back when I made this deck. I, I guess Niv Mizzet Peron would probably be the most powerful uh, commander you could put here, but this is in the 99. So I actually thought this was better in the 99 because of course, Dragon's Approach can go get a dragon and this is a great one to grab. I do have a couple options there. I mostly concentrated on the same name thing. And as I talked about with my Drow new deck, I, I think that's an interesting road to go down. Of course, because in Commander, there's not much to do there in the same name thing, unless you are playing one of those cards that says you can play any number. So the same name thing, I went down that road quite a bit. Lockety Yesterday's spells you cast cost one less to cast for each card with the same name as that spell in your grave graveyard and of course you you do want the dragon's approaches in there in your graveyard right it's really easy to get a couple of them in your graveyard and now all of them just cost one red sphinx of chimes in my drown new deck of course because i can discard two dragon's approaches to draw four cards not too shabby spellweaver helix also works there when it enters the battlefield you remove two target sorcery cards from a single graveyard so you remove two dragon's approaches from your graveyard because whenever a card is cast, if it has the same name as one of the imprinted sorcery cards, you may copy the other one and play it without paying its mana cost. So every time I cast a dragon's approach, I get a copy. Harness the Storm as well, doing the instance and sorcery same name thing and Pyromancer's Ascension as well doing the instance and sorcery same name thing so there is actually funny enough quite a bit of support there so that is the deck it is obviously a dragon's approach deck but i'm, I'm going pretty deep into the same name theme as well my rith liberated primeval deck which is a one of my original five unique builds videos right when i started doing my five unique builds for five commanders this was one of the it was the first or second one i did and again a lot of the commanders in that series are either everyone builds this commander the same way traditionally and i don't really think like, let's try something a little different or I just think people are actually building it the wrong way. And Rift Liberated Primeval, I just think people are building it the wrong way. Other dragons you control have Ward 2. So of course, again, that is that, that, that's sort of a trap that I see with certain commanders. When you see that, you're like, okay, it's a dragon tribal deck. Let's do that. And of course, that's what everybody does with Rift Liberated Primeval. It's nice to have your dragons have Ward 2. However, the, the ability you want to build around is the last one here. At the beginning of your end step, if a creature or planeswalker and opponent controlled was dealt excess damage this turn, create a 4-4 red dragon creature token flying. That's the ability you want. And if I'm just building a deck filled with dragons, I'm not going to be getting that very much, right? I'm going to have to make it so that my opponent blocks. I'm going to have to like force blocks, which is difficult to do because of course dragons all have flying. So it's going to make it very difficult for me to get that trigger if I'm just building a dragon tribal deck. For me, this is a spell slinger deck. Again, I'm building a Naya spell slinger theme. I lightning bolt one of my opponent's creatures that I know has a two toughness or less. Now I'm killing their creature and I'm also getting this trigger because I have dealt excess damage to an opponent's creature this turn and I'm going to get my 4-4 dragon. That's incredible value to be able to just lightning bolt one of your opponent's creatures and then get a 4-4 dragon as well. And of course, the dragons you're creating have ward two. Now I would put, and I did, 
put a few dragons in here, especially the dragons that are actually throwing damage around. Obviously, a Terror of the Peaks is a slam dunk in this deck because it is a dragon that is also throwing damage around. So that's a great fit. But it is mostly a Spellslinger theme. And my favorite fit in this deck is Taminoa. Red, green, and a white. Spirit 2-4. When every non-creature source you control deals damage, you gain that much life. And this actually is a great fit in the deck because of all of the, again, you were in a throwing damage around Spellslinger theme. So this actually works here. Every time we lightning bolt something, we'll get to gain life. So I think this is a really unique and pretty darn good build as well. I, I played a couple of games with this deck and won them all. It actually works really, really well. You just sit back blasting all your opponent's creatures, creating a giant army of dragons. So great deck. My Tigum Graveyard Hate deck, this was a Underwhelming Commander's build. Tigum won the poll, and I had just done one of my 10 deck ideas videos where I talk about hating on your opponent's graveyards, and I'll, I'll get to some of the cards that work so well here. They all happen to be, I mean, they're not all in blue and black, but it just happened to work out that way. I got to make a Tigum deck. Tigum wants stuff to be in your graveyard or can put stuff in your graveyard. So that's why I decided to do this theme. This theme is I want stuff in my graveyard, but I want my opponent's graveyards to be empty. So having our opponent's graveyards empty, obviously the easiest thing in the world, Ley Line of the Void. There's lots of ways to do that. Black is the best color at having a graveyard deck, but also hating on other people's graveyards. And once we have that, we can play cards like Web of Inertia, which our opponents have to exile cards from their graveyard in order to attack us. And if they have no cards in their graveyard, they can't attack us. So this just makes it so that your opponents can't attack you. Gravestorm is a funny one that I've always wanted to use. Black, black, black enchantment at the beginning of your upkeep. Target opponent may exile a card from their graveyard. If that player doesn't, you get the draw card. So it's essentially a Phyrexian Arena if our opponents don't have any cards in their graveyard, which they won't, right? Mist of Stagnation is the big one. This one is going to end games, right? Three blue, blue enchantment. Permanents don't untap during their controller's untap step. That's a powerful effect. At the beginning of each player's upkeep, that player chooses a permanent for each card in their graveyard, then untaps those permanents. So of course, our graveyard is going to be full. We're going to get to pick a card in our graveyard for all of our permanents. We're going to untap everything and our opponents won't be able to untap anything. So likely you'll just have people conceding by the time this guy comes down. We could also do the living death thing, obviously, and we get all cr our creatures back and our opponents get nothing or ill-gotten gains will work as well, where everyone discards their hand and we get to return three cards from our graveyard to our hand. Nobody else gets anything. Really, really neat deck. Very unique. Tygim, again, doesn't have to be the commander here. This is a method two deck where I had the idea first and then the commander came after. I think he is a great fit because he wants to be putting stuff in our graveyard, but you certainly could. I, there is a couple of cards here that certainly fit with Tygum, like Paradox Haze obviously is in the deck because it works great with Tygum. But if you wanted to just take the bones of this deck, the idea, and swap it out for another, I mean, there's been a bunch of blue-black commanders that, that are printed since I came up with this deck. Maybe there's a better one that fits, uh, one that you're currently using that you could just steal this idea and use it there. Feel free to do so. My Inane Death Aspect deck, which again, from my Underwhelming Commander series, and this one, again, this won the poll. I For all those, who, because I don't do it anymore, if you're not familiar with it, I would just put a poll with a bunch of Underwhelming Commanders. Everyone would vote. This one won. And again, I just took a 10 deck ideas, my original 10 deck ideas, I think I had suggested maybe a name death aspect would be an, an idea for a commander for that. It It's covering a whole bunch. There's, there's a whole bunch going on here. You have to check out the video because I talk about all the things that I do in that video. I, I honestly don't even remember all the things. There's so many different little combos going on here, different little interactions. There is the interaction with, of course, your commander is going to come into play and you go get any number of spirit cards and put them into your graveyard. And there's a few things you can do there. Like, for example, you can just go get Revenant, which is a spirit. And if I fill my graveyard with creatures, obviously I can just reanimate my Revenant because, of course, there's a lot of reanimation in this deck. And now I have a flying 2020 or 25, 24, whatever giant flying creature, 
all right? So you could just do that. You could also do the Maskwood Nexus thing, which I am doing in this deck, because of course that makes all my creatures spirits, which in my library is important because then I can get any creature out of my library with my commander and put in my graveyard or in my graveyard. And now I can use Patriarch's Bidding to get everything back, right? So it works both with graveyard and with library. And it also works with one of my favorite janky cards, Hack on Stromgold Scourge, which if I have my Maskwood Nexus, now I can chuck my Hack on into my graveyard and everything in my graveyard is a knight. So now I can cast everything from my graveyard. So another little neat combo in the deck. I also do have Mortal Kombat in the deck, which again is just a super easy win. At the beginning of your upkeep, if you have 20 more creature cards in your graveyard, you win the game. So I can play this and then the next turn cast my commander, go get 20 creatures, chuck them in my graveyard. And if nobody can exile my graveyard, I win. I would imagine if you're playing this deck, it's definitely a deck that you have to play through a few times. There's a lot of different interactions. I'm not gonna go over all of them. Again, you'll have to go watch the video. But in order to actually get really familiar with this deck and all the different things it, it does, you'd have to play test it a bunch. And again, it is an older deck. It's been on my, you know, I made this like at least two years ago. So maybe there's some better cards that could fit in here that could help you with this theme. Pretty neat deck though. Let's talk about Ib Halfheart. And this is one that I would say is not a super unique build. I actually just think it's a really great commander that you can do a lot of neat things with uh, and is super underwhelming. Mostly because of course, it's a mono red goblin tribal and there is uh, for sure a bunch of, I mean, half a dozen, maybe mono red goblin commanders that people would rather go after. So this one gets very much overshadowed, but I think it's a pretty neat commander. Three and a red goblin advisor, three, two, whenever another goblin you control becomes blocked, sacrifice it. If you do, it deals four damage to each creature blocking it. That is some very specific and interesting wording. Um, you can also sacrifice two mountains and create two 1-1 one, one red goblin creature tokens. So, of course, we can very easily do the forced block thing here, like with Nevis' Mask, which I did in this deck, where I can force creatures to block my goblins so that I can then shooting them for damage, essentially. I mean, there's so much going on. Again, this is another deck where there's just so much going on. Obviously, I'm doing the goblin, goblin tribal thing very clearly. I am sacrificing my mountains. I did play into that a little bit. I also did the, the combat trick stuff, right? Like invasion plans, each creature blocks whenever able. So that's going to make it so that my opponents are now forced to block attacking players, choose how each creature blocks. I mean, this is so great in this deck because now any creature that has a four toughness or less, I can basically kill with one of my goblin tokens. I attack, I decide how it blocks. And of course, when it does block, I shoot it for four damage. So now it's dead. Heat Stroke is my favorite fit in this deck. This is a card that probably could fit in a few more decks. At the end of each combat, destroy all creatures that blocked or were blocked this turn. So of course, my commander already has a blocking thing that's gonna force me to sacrifice my blocked goblins. So they're already gonna be dead before the Heat Stroke trigger comes along. So the Heat Stroke's not gonna do nothing for me. It's gonna do something for everyone else though. Any other creature, again, because I'm forcing blocks, you got to block my 1-1 one, one Goblin, and if it's a big, scary whatever, it's going to have to get destroyed at the end of combat because it blocked, right? So really great fit in the deck. There's just a lot of neat things I'm doing in this deck again. And, you know, if you really want to make a Goblin, I just will encourage people, if you have a Cranko deck or some other really busted Goblin Tribal Commander, give Ib Halfheart a try. I think it's a really neat way to go with a Goblin Tribal deck. My Grandeur deck. I did this on my Building Janky deck series. And what is the grandeur? Well, grandeur is a, again, one of those abilities that you're never going to see in the commander format because it's really difficult to use, like on Korlash, Heir to Blackblade. Discard another card named Korlash, Heir to Blackblade. Search your library for up to two swamp cards. Put them onto the battlefield, tap, then shuffle. So this is an ability that is literally almost unusable, almost unusable in the commander format, because of course I can't have more than one card named Korlosh, Heir to Blackblade, right? So how am I ever going to discard a card named that? And of course, in order to discard it, I actually have to have that card in my hand. So of course, the only way to do it is to make a copy. And some people do this. Obviously, this is the commander for some decks where people actually, I have a patron who has this deck and there are ways to do it. Only a couple, it's very difficult, it's very fringe. What I did is I decided to make a deck where these cards were in the 99. It's a blue-black deck, 
and I took the two best, what I think are the best grandeur abilities. Korolosh's is pretty darn good, but my favorite is Lanessa Zephyr Mage, which says discard another card named Lanessa Zephyr Mage. Target player returns a creature they control to owner's hand, then repeat the process for artifact, enchantment, and land. So every time you discard a card named Lanessa Zephyr Mage, they have to bounce a creature, enchantment, artifact, and land. That's pretty punishing. I actually had a deck in Modern that used that ability because you, if you filled your hand with the three, because of course in modern, you can actually play four copies. I have one in play and three in my hand. If I discard all three to that ability, it's game over. My opponent just picked up their entire board, right? It's actually pretty good. I also chose those two because black and blue were the colors I wanted because of course blue does the cloning copying thing the best and Sakashima of a thousand faces is one of the commanders for this deck. So our commander can do that. And of course there's a zillion other ways in blue to be cloning and copying our secret commanders, I guess you could call them. And of course the legend rule doesn't apply to permanents we control. So it's very easy to create legendary token copies and without it actually bothering us. Tormod the Desecrator was the other commander, of course, partner commander for this deck because we needed black, but also stuff is going to be leaving our graveyard a lot, which is another thing that we will have to be doing. And of course the legendary copy thing on, honestly, you can get a little bit of Nonbo situation where we don't want Sakashima's ability because we can create a token copy of our Lanessa, then have it die to the dies rule and then get it back to our hand. Cause of course we got to get it back to our hand somehow. Right. And of course in black, again, very easy to do. That's one of the things we want black for in this deck is for a card like Phyrexian Reclamation where, okay, now I can just have them die, return it to my hand, then discard it, return it to my hand. And then I can just repeat the process for two mana and two life. So that's why I wanted black and blue. I wanted black and blue for both the abilities that those colors give me, but also I thought Korlash and Lanessa were the best options for the grand durability. You're getting the most payoff there. So really, really neat, unique deck, I think. Give it a try if you're interested. My Pelucranos Reborn deck. And this one, again, is to me just a, a, a commander. I've talked about this a few times on my channel. I think it's a fantastic commander. It is way more unpopular than I thought it would be. The route that I went, of course, we got to build around the back because the back is what you want whenever Pelucranos Engine of Ruin or another non-token Hydra you control dies, create a 3-3 green white Phyrexian Hydra creature token with reach and a 3-3 green and white Phyrexian Hydra creature token with lifelink. So we want our creatures to be dying. And as I figured out pretty quickly, it's very easy to do that with Hydras because a lot of them are 0-0 zero, zero creatures with the, the X casting cost like Hungering Hydra, right? If I just pay one green mana for my Hungering Hydra, as soon as it hits the battlefield, of course, it's going to die because it's a 0-0. Zero, zero. It dies to state-based effects and my Polucranos will trigger and give me two 3-3 three, three tokens. So for one mana, I'm getting two 3-3 three, three tokens. That's pretty fantastic. And if you're building around that strategy, there really is a lot of funny things you can do, right? Ascend from Avernus, Turn all creature and planeswalker cards with mana value X or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. So again, if I'm returning all those Hydras in my graveyard, you're doing a little bit of a graveyard strategy here. Funny enough, it's almost an aristocrats deck in white and green. I just have to pay X is one here. So I pay four mana, return all those one drop Hydras that of course instantly die. If I get three back, they all instantly die. And now I've just created nine three, three tokens. Really fantastic. Ecological appreciation. There's lots of these cards that end up working working, you know, in the commander format, I would say don't work super great, but here work pretty fantastic because the mana value you're looking for here is X and X is going to be one. And then they're going to come into play and instantly die. My favorite fit here is wild pair for green, green enchantment. Whenever a creature enters the battlefield, if you cast it from your hand, you may search your library for a creature card with the same total power and toughness and put it onto the battlefield. So what happens here again, I'm going to cast my hungering Hydra. What's the total power and toughness here? Of course, it's zero. So that means I can go search my library for any Hydra with a zero total power and toughness, which is pretty much all of them. And I get to go put that into play, which of course dies, which of course gets me more tokens. So a lot of really neat interactions in this deck. I think Polukronos is a great commander, but the way I built this deck is particularly fun and interesting. All right, next up, my Morite of the Frost deck, which I call my Morite the Land deck. And the reason why it is called Morate the Land is because I think probably nobody out there is doing this. I don't think Morate of the Frost can copy 
other things other than creatures. Obviously copying creatures is the best option, but you can copy other things as well, right? You may have Moray of the Frost and Terry of the Battlefield as a copy of a permanent you control, except it's legendary in snow in addition to its other types. And if it's a creature, it enters with two additional plus one plus one counters on it and has changeling. And this certainly is one of the jankier decks I've ever made. I'm getting way to the janky stuff as I get up this list. I would say the top three on this list are, are three of the jankiest decks I've ever made, but also super interesting and fun. So the idea of this deck is I make my commander into a land. So of course I'm copying a land, right? And then I'm going to turn it into a creature. And of course there's lots of things that turn lands into creatures. I mean, funny enough, there's actually a fair amount of cards that are turning snow lands into creatures. Of course, we are doing the snow theme here, obviously. One of the best is Avalanche Caller. One in a blue human wizard, one three. Pay two, target snow land you control becomes a four four elemental creature with hexproof and haste until end of turn. It's still a land. We can use this on our other lands as well, but we're going to copy a land with our commander and then we're going to turn it into this. Giving it hexproof as well is pretty nice. Of course, ideally, we want to turn our commander into, say, a lotus field, which already has hexproof, right? If we copy Lotus Field with our commander. It's going to tap for three mana, which is pretty good, but it also has Hexproof, or we can copy a Dark Steel Citadel, which now means our commander has Indestructible. Even without that stuff, it's going to be really, really hard to get our commander off the table. That's one of the advantages to this strategy. I know it seems incredibly janky, but a big advantage here is if your opponents don't have land destruction, targeted land destruction, which you should, but they might not, it's going to be really difficult to get your commander off the table. Your commander will be a creature during your turn, usually, and then on everyone else's turn, it's not going to be. It's going to be a land, so any board wipe, it gets around. That's a massive advantage for you. And even on your turn, we can cast, say, a Devastation Tide. Return all non-land permanents to owner's hand. Well, of course, your commander is a land, so that's not going to bounce your commander. Your commander gets to stick around, right? We can Oblivion Stone as well. Sacrifice it, destroy each non-land permanent. Your commander is a land. So all of these things, right, we're building around the advantage of having our commander as a land. And then, of course, Course, we can play the land tribal stuff as well, like Halimar Tidecaller, land creatures you control have flying. So now our commander, when we turn it into a creature, will have flying as well. Really, really neat deck, I think. It is certainly jank. The jank level is pretty high here. I would say the jank level is like a seven, but it is essentially a Voltron deck, right? You're turning your commander into a land and then turning that land into a creature and killing your opponents with commander damage. It's super janky, I know, but I think it actually works really well. Next up, one of the jankiest decks I have ever made on my channel, which I actually call the most death-defying deck ever assembled, which is my Egon deck. And, you know, back then I was just, this is very early on in my channel, and I would just find commanders and just try to come up with a way to build around them. And Egon, I didn't love as a commander. It's not particularly great. I built around essentially the backside you know, that's sort of the, the, you can use either the front or the back with this build, but I thought the back was, was better used here. Throne of death, one black mana legendary artifact at the beginning of your upkeep mill a card. And this is because we want to be self milling here. You can also pay two and a black tap exile a creature card from your graveyard to draw a card. So card advantage on your commander, pretty good. We'll just say there are certainly commanders that would be better than Egon in the command zone for this deck. Tormod, which I have in the 99 is probably likely a great commander for this deck. There is just honestly way too much to talk about here with this deck. You, you really, this one for sure of all of these, you gotta go watch the video. It is very death defying to say the least. You are dancing on the head of a pin in a hurricane while someone pelts you with oranges is I believe what I said. Um, you, you gotta go check out the deck tech for this one. There's just way too much going on here. I think it's the longest deck tech on my entire channel. So go check it out if you're interested in this one. I will end off with my original janky deck that I put on my channel, which is my Goat Tribal deck, my Zerta Goat Tribal deck. I thought, let's try to build a Goat Tribal deck. Let's see if we can do it. And of course, there's not a whole lot of goats. Mostly you're going to get your goats from creating tokens. And of course, creating those tokens, it's activated abilities and Zerta reduces the activated abilities. I thought white and red were the best colors here for this. And I liked the reduction of the activation cost because mostly 
The, the repetitive ways to create those goat tokens are with activated abilities. Springjack Pasture probably being the best. Of course, it's a land. Taps to add a colorless, but you can pay for and tap. Create an 01 white goat creature token. And of course, with our commander in play, that's only two mana. And tap sacrifice X goats, add X mana of any one color, and you gain X life. So it also gives us a way to use those goats, right? When I saw this, I'm like, man, that would work great in a goat tribal deck, but where are you going to play that? It was actually printed in a commander set. I'm not sure where they intended people to play it but I'm playing it here. Trading Post is another one that will create GOAT tokens. Unfortunately, our commander is not reducing this ability, but pay one tap, pay one life, create an 01 GOAT token. Again, repeatable effect, which is good. We also have Spring Jack Shepherd, three and a white Kithkin Wizard, one, two. When Spring Jack Shepherd enters the battlefield, create an 01 white GOAT creature token for each white mana symbol in the mana cost of permanence you control, which again is kind of nice with Zerta because of course it's got those two white pips. So at the very least we're getting three goats here. Probably want to wait to get a whole bunch more. But then what are we doing? <laughs> like, how is this helping us to close out the game? It's obviously not doing a whole lot. How are you going to close out the game? Well, a really interesting way I came up with is with, of course, again, benefiting from our commander's ability, like Akron Phalanx, three and a white human soldier, three, three with vigilance, two and a red creatures you control get plus one, plus oh, and to lend a turn. So we're just pumping up our creatures. And of course, with our commander in play, this only costs one red. So for every one red mana, we're giving our team plus one, plus oh, not too shabby. And that further can benefit us because then we can fell the mighty, right? We can play into that theme. All of our creatures are zero power, right? Or most of them other than our commander. So we can just choose our goat, destroy all creatures with power greater than target creature's power. And then after we've wiped the board, right, then we can start pumping up our team. Porphyros, of course, is the best way to do this. This guy's an absolute slam dunk here because whenever another creature enters the battlefield under control, it deals two damage to each opponent. And as anyone who played a Porphyros deck knows, creating all those tokens works really great there. But also, most people don't use this ability, has the two and a red creatures you control get plus one, plus oh, and to lend a turn. So, I mean, this guy's going to survive the board wipes because it's indestructible, but also after everyone's board has been wiped, we can pump our whole team here very easily. Super janky. This is definitely like an eight, maybe even a nine on the jank scale. It's a difficult one, but a very, very unique one. One of the most unique decks I've made on my channel. These are all my favorites. These are all my favorite decks I've done on my channel since its inception. Hundreds and hundreds of decks I have combed through and I grabbed the 10 that are my personal favorite. Again, a lot of you probably have never even seen these decks before because they were on, you know, a few of them were on the very early days of my channel. Now you get to check them out yourself. If you're at all interested, you can grab the deck list below. Have fun with it. That is it for today though. And thanks for tuning in.